The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. These intros are pretty badass, not going to lie. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got to get Bonnie up here. I'll add him to stage. Yeah. There we go. Good morning, gentlemen. Good hey, morning. Bonnie. Happy New Year. Happy New Year's. Who made the intro, by the way? Um, I think our our editor in uh well in an undisclosed location i, I, I cannot reveal hmm. <laughs> I, would, I would ask is he is he in the chat i don't want to mention his it's, name it's a she it's a she she does she. does a ton of work for us she edits all the monero topia videos very talented we pay her with monero and nice. uh, she's she's actually a fantastic monero story the story of monero working as intended i'll put it to you that way i've kind of spoken about it in the past but i probably shouldn't say too much all the time okay well i'll stop asking questions then yeah no 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 worries no worries uh it's just it's just, yeah yeah but she, she's great cool well uh are you Wait, guys so, hold on sanita so saying she made this intro i thought it was ava uh, okay. Wow. Look, we got Sunita out of her out of her seat. Wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, kudos to Sunita. So, buddy, I, obviously we got. Uh, I haven't checked the price this morning, but it looks like yesterday Monero was taking a hit. Um, I don't know if crypto in general has been recently taking a hit. Uh, it depends I, on which crypto. The whole wider um, the whole wider market pulled back, right? Even beyond crypto, and I think that brought crypto with it. And then obviously we have everything with the. Uh, with the potential delisting. So curious to hear your, your overall take on things. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to lie. <clears throat> I haven't really been like super heavily focused on price every day. So I don't want to, I don't want to pretend like any, I'm going to be able to give any like big insights here on this price report today. So ah. um, yeah, I know it's like, what a, what a lame disclaimer, <clears throat> but um, you know, we can look at the charts. We can look at what everything did. Um, I mean, for the most part, everything's still pretty flat, pretty steady state, um, which is which is fine. Like as far as like the stock market pulling back, I think that's a good thing. Like we 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 don't want to see things just parabolic, like immediately parabolically run up. That's like it's not good. That wouldn't be a good situation. So, for example, here's the Nasdaq. Um, this area right here. Uh, actually, this is the Nasdaq futures, but right this area right here. Um, let's drop a line. Uh, that horizontal area was uh, the previous all-time high from back in the end of 2021. Um, and we broke that, right? We said, hey, if the cabal wants to tell everyone um, sort of subtly or or like push the psychology bullish, they're going to probably break that all-time high before we come back down to, um, to retest it. And that's what happened here. You'll notice I have these purple lines turned on. Um, again, oh, yeah, wait, wait, hold on. yeah, we can't see the chart here. Hold up a sec. Oh. Uh, um, I'm sitting here talking, talking. Uh, yeah, we, uh, where's that screen? Oh, here we go. It says, oh, uh, not connected. I see charts. It says devices. How about, not how about now? I added you too. Okay, also, there you go. Um, I just... <laughs> Sorry about there that. Goes. No worries. Okay, now we can yeah, see it. Yeah, I've updated. I've done everything I can, like Firefox, my system, yada, yada. Every time that I try and add um, StreamYard and then present on these Firefox charts, like it'll just, it crashes immediately. So what I have to do is um, I use a different browser, and luckily StreamYard allows you to share, like to choose which window you want to share, which screen you want to share. So anyways, I've got to like use a double browser setup to make this thing work. Anyways, okay, so uh, so I'll just, I'll go back here a second and we'll go backwards. So we're looking at the NASDAQ here. Uh, this is technically, technically NASDAQ futures, which basically pretty close match uh, the NASDAQ. Uh, okay, so what we're saying here is that this all-time high, right? This was the previous all-time high, 2021, um, and like slightly 2022 even. Um, what I said is that if if the cabal wants to like put the sort of um, uh, the the positive momentum in people's minds, right? The bullish sentiment. What they'll do is they'll break that all-time high um, for a little bit before they come back down to test it. And and when I say like they come back down to test it, I'm not implying that like they are in control of the markets 100% with their you know, with their fingers on the on the wheels and they, they can just like do anything they want. Um, it's more like they can influence big macro movements at a minimum um, and they can keep things, they can keep pushing things in certain directions. Um, but a lot of intraday movement, a lot of other kinds of movements, there, there's still a lot of like organic um, stuff that happens out there. And when I say organic, I mean like the 
the totality of high frequency traders, plebs getting into and out of positions, um, big money moving in and out of positions, banks printing money and deciding which uh, which stocks are going to receive new liquidity. Anyways, um, so yeah, we basically broke the previous all-time high, coming back down, retesting it here. Um, could we come back down one more time to uh, to this area? Um, sure, I'm sure we could. Uh, I've kind of got this guy drawn out here. There's a whole bunch of different ways that we could draw this channel. Um, but the main thing, actually, let me just delete that line. The main thing that I wanted to show you guys on this chart were these purple lines. So again, these purple lines are statistical levels, just like the blue lines, just like the, blue, uh, the orange lines. Orange and the blue lines are one standard deviation. White is the moving averages, right? And we're talking about overlaying all of them from like the, the 10 day all the way up to the 5,000 day. Um, we just overlay them all because we want to look for clustering because clustering is where um, the most the, the most number of people are going to sort of be attracted to those areas without realizing it in aggregate. So the purple lines was something that we had to create um, because you'll notice the blue lines don't they just it doesn't necessarily give us the full picture that we need um, to create like sort of resistances um, and know where like where topping areas are. So um Essentially, it's it's like a derivation of the upper standard deviation. It is not a multiplication factor because that's arbitrary. Um, it's, it's basically just a standard deviation of a standard deviation line and adding it to that. So anyways, on a long term time scale, what I would expect the NASDAQ to do ultimately is to um, to eventually press up here to these to this purple band area. And depending on how long um, how long they want to make that run, um, you would just expect to essentially trend in between the blue and, and purple bands um, on the way up. Now, one thing that we probably need to start considering is, is that we are in an election year, and the pattern has been for a long time that crises, whether it's financial or whatever, you name it, right, 2020, um, they usually happen around the election cycle. That could be immediately before. It could be immediately after. Um, go back to 2001, right? Bush takes office nine months later, 9-11. 2008 crisis uh, happens just after Obama takes office. Um so usually, especially when there's a changing of the guard, it seems like big crises have have hit. So and then again, um, Biden gets elected and Trump was like the last guy to like he oversaw the end. <laughs> sorry, the end of Trump's uh, term oversaw the beginning of the COVID stuff. Uh, and then Biden assumed uh, control after that. So if there's going to be a changing of the guard, expect something major to happen. But ironically, I'm starting to play with this idea that if Biden wins the real, the, the re, well, quote unquote wins, let's let's use that term very loosely, uh, wins in the full power spectrum of what it means to win. Um, not implying, actually, I am implying something there. Uh, anyways, uh, if he quote unquote wins, I would probably expect the markets to basically just continue steady state, um, mostly up, right? That would be a good sign that, that there's bull market here to come. If there's a changing of the guard, if there's like some other pre-planned person selected to go into that uh, position, into the presidential spot, uh, then, then that would probably that would put more weight on the potential for some kind of um, economic crisis to happen. So, um, yeah. So I guess we're already on macro. So why don't we just go ahead and stay on macro? Let's take a look. Let, let's break down. Actually, let's look at the top level liquidity first, and then we'll break down the components of that liquidity. Okay. So here's the Nasdaq yet again. Um, Nasdaq's not as important as the green line, which is the U.S. total liquidity. Again, U.S. total liquidity. We're talking about reverse repos, uh, the Treasury balance sheet, M2SL and the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So um, it took a big dip right at the new year, but then it popped right back up. So basically liquidity is as high as it has been since, um, God, man, that was really high back then, uh, as, as it's been since basically the top of the uh, bull market. One thing that's interesting is that the, the liquidity actually peaked after um, the peak of the bull market. So maybe there's a lesson in there. I'm not quite sure. Speculatively uh, brainstorming, I might say, okay, well, um, perhaps there just wasn't any more juice to squeeze from the market. So it reversed, uh, first and they tried to push it up again with more liquidity failed. Uh, and then, and then, um, basically the liquidity followed suit. Um, but in this case, you know, the other thing too, is like, you might look at this and say, well, the, the NASDAQ actually looked like it kind of led the total liquidity. Um, and that's because there's different components here that make up this liquidity. And I think they have different velocities in terms of how quickly they get into the market. Uh, anyways, the point is that liquidity is still pretty high. It's not showing us like the overall liquidity is not showing us um, the potential for a massive crash here or anything like that. Um, let's take a look at the reverse repos, because I think that the reverse repos was the primary driver of the um, a primary driver of the bear market. Um, or maybe we should say it's a primary a primary correlated 
um, asset or not asset, but correlated chart. Uh, and also it's been primarily correlated for us um, on the rebound, right? On on the sort of uh, new bull market, the incipient, um, cautiously optimistic bull market. So um, the reason that we saw that dip on the New Year's was because we saw a huge spike. And what's interesting is that we saw the exact same spike on the last New Year's. So this spike right here, um, massively like that happened like the day before or the, the, you know, the week leading up to the change over the new year, we saw the same thing here and then it came right back down immediately after the new year. So I'm sure there's like some fundamental reason that I haven't divinated just quite yet. Um, but at any rate, uh, sitting at about 600 and eh, let's just call it 700 billion. Still $700 billion of the reverse repos that could hypothetically come out of the reverse repos. And that would be liquidity for bond markets. That would be liquidity for stock markets. And you need both to be stable, particularly you need bond markets to be stable um, or increasing, uh, which means that bond rates are slowly decreasing while the, the value of those bonds are increasing. Um, you need bonds to be relatively stable um, to keep stock market gains on the table. Uh, it's true because it rhymes. So uh, let's see. Da -da. Let's go keep on keeping up with the macro idea here, or the macro theme. Bonds. OK, so here's what the bond situation looks like. Um, yeah, bonds came down significantly, uh, and probably again, this was a significant driver of the recent gains in stock market. Looks like it's taken a little bit of a pause here, but overall, this is still steady state. Um, this chart is suspicious, but only on a long term sense. We're waiting for yields to get below uh, the tabletop. Um, and let's see, what was the other thing I wanted to show you guys? Oh, interestingly enough, the Federal Reserve balance sheet is like still continues to come down. What's crazy is that usually the balance sheet coming down has been correlated with, with bear markets, with downside action, et cetera. Um, but I think because of the new dynamic that the uh, the reverse repo market introduces, I think that the Federal Reserve balance sheet has been able to get away um, with decreasing. They've been able to um, to drop this thing pretty significantly. Like we're talking, what is that? Almost nine trillion now sitting at um, seven point seven trillion. So, I mean, they, they've been able to, uh, to drop like over $2 trillion from this balance sheet so far. Um, and I think, uh, this is again, like this kind of stuff, we're looking at this because it, it tells you that they have tricks up their sleeve. They have new things they can do. They've always got like, they, they learned from their mistakes in the past. They learned from 2008 and they like, they locked down that banking crisis last year in March. Like they were like, Nope, that's not going to happen. We're going to take care of it now. Um, even though in a lot of ways you might have said it was worse than the 2008, like the potential there was worse than 2008, but they were on it like fucking flies on shit. So um, they they prevented anything major from happening there. And um, I think that was like, uh, you know, that kind of fooled the um, the recession now people, right? We've had the recession now people for like for a year or longer telling us about recession. It's like, well, where's the recession? It hasn't happened yet, um, at least not officially. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what the macro situation looks like. Um, interesting. Oh no, that's not good. <sighs> updating, updating is like always such a dicey thing. Maybe I need to drop Firefox. Okay, anyways, at least that tab got restored. Uh, but anyways, that's that's basically the macro. Uh, you know, we didn't look at oil. Let's look at oil just quickly. Uh, oh, and we didn't look at gold. Okay, so oil is like again, just it's stable, right? This is what we want. We want to see it here in this area. Uh, if you want gains, you know, and also like inflation, we want to keep inflation down. Hope inflation stays down. So oil's good. Gold, um, you know, it's just still consolidating. It's a very long term chart. Gold can, could continue to consolidate for quite a while. It could break out at any moment. Who knows when? I don't know. Probably the cabal does know. Um, but uh, yeah, gold could break out at, at some point here, but it's still right now just consolidating. Um, all right, let's go to Monero. Let's take a look at the travesty of what happened the past few days. Um, so yeah, we <laughs> we were looking good. Uh, you know, it felt, felt good. Felt like we should move up. And then I don't know, does the, did the Binance news cause this? Is Do they have... Have they been saving up a reserve to drop on the market? Are they like, who knows what's going on? The government has now got their hands all up inside of Binance's business. Um, and so who knows what the government is going to want them to do when it comes to Monero. Um, and when it comes to like these statements that they're making, it's like, and they're, they're like really jacking things around. They're like, oh, well, you know, we need to hear a response from these, from these uh, <laughs> corporations of coins. Um, and we're like, we don't have a corporation, bro. It's so like, well, you know, maybe we won't deal with you, but probably we will. But maybe we won't, right? Like they've just been vacillating. So um, maybe this has something to do with that. Maybe it's pre-planned. Um, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, but you know what? Fuck them, and who cares? Um, you know, Monero is going to continue to function. We're going to continue like having some kind of price support on the basis of its legitimate organic usage. Uh, the transactions I thought were interesting. We had that big bounce up here. 
Uh, and then, and then things just crashed down, um, for the Christmas, like basically right around Christmas. Um, I don't know, like, I don't like these big, large pumps here. Um, but at the same time, maybe there is some evidence that we had people that people were making a lot of Monero transactions. I mean, it's pre Christmas, um, people go on vacation, right? People got to move their money around. People rotate keys. Some people rotate keys, you know, once a year, once every couple of years. And the New Year's time frame is a, is a good time to do that. So maybe this was like organic. I, I, I am like, sometimes I am suspicious when we get like massive pump spikes up. I, I do wonder, um, I do wonder how much their chain analysis can target people for narrow time frames um, to try and like maybe find some um, like statistical probabilities in a certain direction that that helps them know where to look. I, I don't know. That's that's speculative. Who really knows what their capabilities are? We know they're working on it. We know they're like at a minimum. We know that these guys are probably um, experimenting to see what they can see. Right. There's. It, when it comes to statistical math, there's always the theory of the math. And then there's like really what happens in the real world. Can you validate your theory in the real world, especially with something as complex as a system like Monero? Um, you're you're going to have to go take your ideas and then try and validate them in the real, real world. So, um, you know, it's not that hard to flood Monero with some transactions for a period of time, especially with the kind of uh, with the kind of money they're dealing with. So, I mean, it. I have to imagine that some of these spikes, that doesn't mean all, but some of these spikes probably are um, chain analysis trying to see what they can see. Um, let's take a look at the Bitcoin uh, transaction fees because this is always a lull chart. Uh, still, actually, it's come back down a little bit, um, hovering in between ten and twenty dollars. Um, you know, maybe this is a maybe this is a sign. Maybe the uh, VRC twenties are going to take a break here soon. Uh, who knows? Right now, Bitcoin is just the output set is being massively polluted with um, basically tokens. They're using outputs to represent tokens. That's what a BRC20 is. Uh, but let's take a look at the, the total crypto market. So let's see. Uh, oh, we had talked about some Monero transactions. We talked about them spiking. Um, the chart wasn't like super relevant to that little rant. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin yeah, transactions yeah. hovering between 10 and I 20. Mean, what do you think? That's that's pretty clear that that was some kind of, uh, right? That, was, that wasn't an, certainly wasn't an organic movement. Right. That, no, that's what I was saying is that a lot of this maybe it could have been organic because, um, you know, it's it's pre holidays. So people might be selling um, to go on vacation, buy presents. Um, they might be rotating keys because it's the end of year. And I mean, we have heard there has been no shortage of stories this year for reasons to rotate your keys, which is in it, like in and of itself. That's inherently dangerous to rotate your keys. But it, right. apparently it's also dangerous to not rotate your keys. So um that's yeah, there's been no true. no shortage of reasons. So there might have been a lot of people rotating keys. It happens at the end of year, um, or a lot of people do that kind of like housekeeping stuff towards the end of year. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of that might have been organic. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it's interesting that it crashed so much after, right? And then it like it like goes so low. Does that yeah, matter? well, I mean, it's Christmas holidays, so you know you're doing all your stuff. You're doing all your stuff. What are we looking at here? December twenty second. Uh, nobody's touching their third. stuff. After Christmas. Yeah. Oh wow, Christmas was actually still pretty high. Uh, you know what's funny? Because Arctic Mine always references Christmas as like the the date that you know for testing, right? Like when he talks about the Visa network, obviously, and when he like talks about uh, you know designing designing Monero to be able to withstand a big influx and then adjust, right? And be able uh, to yeah. have spikes. It's funny he always uses Christmas as the uh, Christmas time as the as the as the 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 moment that Monero would be able to have to be able to handle so it is interesting i don't know i mean looking back do we always see a spike around that time no we've seen other christmases where it drops off significantly let's go right. to the three year actually we'll go to the all time view uh, we'll just go to the modern era of monero what do you think body like you think we're we're going to enter a new a new normal here in terms of uh, Monero transactions for 2024, right? Like 20K has seemed to be the, the number for Monero in terms of daily transactions for the last year. You think we yeah. level you think we level up nicely here? Like do we see see that happening soon? Like a nice move up in terms of daily average on a on a consistent basis? I th I think it's reasonably possible, yeah, that, that could happen. Although we have to ask ourselves if um, if Binance and other exchanges delist Monero, does that cause does that cause the number of transactions to drop off? Right? If because right, right. that will be less liquidity, so there there might be a transaction drop off. It'll it might be really cause interesting it go if they up. delist and it doesn't drop off. Right, right, or it goes up, right? Because I mean that that would be the most bullish thing, right? And maybe that would, that would be, be because if people want to continue to 
to speculate on Monero or, or if they were currently obtaining it through Binance and they're using other means, those other means will probably involve more on-chain transactions, right? Potentially. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's yeah. that's definitely possible. Maybe yeah. there would be less batching of transactions. So yeah. you, would, you would see more individual transactions. Like that could be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would be that would be fantastic if they delisted and we saw the transactions go up. It's interesting because Monero's had like pretty consistent transactions for a long period of time now, like on, yeah. on the scale of years. Um, you know, we're basically looking between say fifteen and thirty thousand transactions is like pretty pretty closely defined, like the center point there at twenty. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because our price has also been fairly consistent uh, at that level. So uh, yeah, just something to think about maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't want, we didn't want to quite leave on Monero yet. Um, as much as I don't want to show this chart. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're like Monero Bitcoin is now, I mean, we're at 0 0.034. Like this is the worst it's been since, uh, you know, since the bull market. So yeah, we're getting, uh, yeah. I mean, it is what it is, guys. Uh, what are you going to do? Like we just broke down there. And then also, um, you know, you've got uh, the dominance here. Actually, let's, Let's pull Bitcoin out of this chart and let's just look at. Um, so uh, and, and I apologize if you said this before, because I was kind of tweeting over here. So what it, what is your current take with regards to the Binance delisting and Monero? Like, are you think we're seeing an impact from that? Do you think that's already priced in or it's getting priced in now or there there is no pricing in it? Like, what's what is your overall take there with with the Binance? <laughs> I guess I don't really have a take, to be honest. I I suspect that the people behind the scenes in Binance and now probably with some sort of uh, covert, um, thinly veiled, heavy hand and crack in as well. I have to imagine that there's there's probably some shit going on behind the scenes um, and they're probably trying to consider what their best options are. It's possible that Binance has a big obligation of Monero that they can't really meet um, and they could be looking at ways because like the government doesn't want Monero listed. Um, it's funny because we finally, we agree on something. <laughs> just, they want it delisted. We want it delisted, but they might be trying to say, how can we do this um, without pumping the price by having to acquire all the Monero that we need? Now, uh, remember last show, I said that there is the possibility that they might try and like um, put price pressure on. They might really try and skew things in a particular direction um, to try and acquire that Monero on the cheap, to try and get as much of it as they can to fill their order books or to fill their obligations so that they can delist it. I think it's possible that the reason they vacillated on like saying, hey, we're going to delist you. And then, well, you know, we're, we're reconsidering now, but you, you know, you got to be good now. Uh, they might be doing that to try and jack the market around in such a way that they're able to acquire more Monero. They're probably, again, assuming that they don't, that they aren't fully reserved now they need a way to acquire enough Monero to pay out their obligations before they delist it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, you know, yeah. So they're, they're trying to manipulate it downwards so they can grab some cheap Monero to, to essentially be able to, to come up with the Monero that they owe people. Right. Um, but what do you think of, I mean, I, I do, I don't know. I, I'm seeing more viewers than ever. We're at a, uh, we're at a solid 40, over 40 viewers, which we've gotten before. We got up to 50, but I see it's I see a tick up. I feel like we're we're starting to see the beginning of the Streisand effect. Like because it, it's Monero is is so under attack here. I think it is starting to uh you know get the word out more with regards to Monero. Is my is my anecdotal take. Let's see. All right, I'll I i do not have too much here left on the price report. Um we were looking at Monero dominance. I don't know exactly where I left you guys, but um, we were looking at the Bitcoin versus Monero. Yeah, all right, we were talking about Binance. There's definitely machinations going on in the background there when it comes to, um, well, I say definitely, but I, let me rephrase. It's I think it's very likely. I think it's very reasonable to suspect there's machinations happening in the background there with the government and Binance and probably Kraken now too, since they're then since they're on the ropes. But um, and you know Jesse Powell is not the CEO anymore. So like, anyways, it's you guys kind of closed it off nicely by saying, yep, we're going to have to, you know, we got to actually use Monero. We actually have to like make parallel economies and, and do all those things. Um, and good. Maybe like, maybe the government just is forcing us to, to live up to our own, um, to our own words. So um, 
Monero dominance here, this is actually not Monero dominance because there's too much Bitcoin um, in that chart, right? Uh, we already know what that chart looks like. So uh, what we did here is we took Monero, the Monero market cap and divided it by total three um, and then multiplied by some very large numbers so that my um, my wave magic stuff still works here. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see that basically um, since really since November, uh, Monero dominance relative to shitcoins has tanked significantly. And <clears throat> I mean, this is this is a sign of leverage. It's a sign of degeneracy. I mean, I, I bear some culpability in this chart as well. I'm not going to lie. Um, but at the same time, like this chart was going to do this regardless of what I did. And it's like the, it's the fucked up thing in the way that they control the system is that they know they can push this. Let's suppose like the, the, the effect of the cabal, the cabal can move price. They can move relative prices by, let's say, let's just let's just call it 50 percent. And then they know that the plebs are going to take care of the rest of that 50 percent of the direction they want to move things because they're going to sort of create in the in the minds of the masses in the in the mass psychology. Um, of course, tabs are just crashing again. Damn it. I guess I have all kinds of technical problems today. They're going to create in the minds of the masses um, the what they the the direction that needs to happen, and the plebs are going to take it the rest of the way. They say, "Oh, well, things are going to go that way anyway, so I might as well get on the right side of it." Uh, and that would be me, right? That would be me when I'm trading these shit coins that I tell you guys about sometimes. Um, you know, I don't want to like call them all shit coins. I mean, it's it's it, that's that's like still kind of like a maximalist holdover that I have. Some of them are shit coins. Some of them actually might have promise to do real things um, that could actually like be useful in the real world, uh, or at least in the financial world. So oh, guys, since that time, I, just gotta, I gotta jump in. We're over sixty viewers now, holding steady. So the the like and share works, guys. You will keep smash as you like and be happy. Keep retweeting, and we're uh, we're at a. Yeah, or over over twelve viewers on Twitter Spaces, and we're at sixty viewers on YouTube. Nice, growing. Yeah, keep, keep retweeting. We don't do that enough, but so, sorry, buddy. Go ahead. Keep no, going. no, please, please. That's that's definitely more important than whatever I was ranting about, especially since my tab crashed. All right, so the tab crashed. I guess it's time to move on from Monero. God dang it, man! Technical problems out the ass today. Uh, okay, so we got Bitcoin <laughs> here. <laughs> We got we got Bitcoin here, and as we've talked about, it's it's like riding these upper standard deviations. These are not hard resistances. It can pop above it. It's possible. Um, I was kind of uh, looking forward to maybe hearing, uh, you know, the approval, the SEC approval of the ETFs. Maybe they'll just wait until January tenth. Um, is it January? I think it's January tenth, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> um, you know, that date being right. It was January tenth. Or was it January sixth? I can't remember. What's the fake? January sixth. January 6th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, happy happy fake Revolution Day, guys, or fake? Um, oh shit! Whatever yeah. it was, <laughs> fake uh, uprising, rebellion day. Never forget, guys. Never forget. <laughs> it was a dark bad. day. We almost we lost can... democracy. We, yeah, <laughs> democracy almost failed that day. <laughs> Thank God for our brave fighting men and women. And Jeez. also our Congress people that bravely stood up to the dude yes. wearing horns, <laughs> whatever happened there. All right. Yet I digress. Yet we digress. So here's the Bitcoin chart. There's nothing special about this chart except for it's gone up a lot. Um, I'm not convinced that it's like this is the real like time to break the all time high. Um, the pattern. So and I, I did a little bit of um, looking into this uh, this week. The pattern that happened last time, October 15th the ETFs are announced to be approved. Most of the pump happened before that ETF announcement came, which was special. October 15th, the, the announcement happened, Bitcoin pumps, um, something like 15%-ish. Actually, you know what? Why why wouldn't we have the chart here? Why wouldn't I just show you? Okay, uh, October 15th, right here. Okay, so drop a line, that vertical line, that was the day that the ETF announcement was approved. You'll see that Bitcoin pumped about 16%. 15%. Um, and then it kind of like took a little break and then it had a secondary high. What's interesting, if we were to overlay the Bitcoin dominance, or actually let's let's overlay total um, total two. Uh, new price scale. All right, so we're going to overlay total two. We're going to make it just be a line because the candles are silly. But we're going to tell it to show us the high price. Okay. Um, so you'll notice that um, you know Bitcoin getting the ETF announcement. It you know it was like the first pump, 
total followed and it continued following for almost a month. There's about a four week, three to four week period here. And then total two, or yeah, total two, everything else but Bitcoin peaked significantly um, about a month afterwards. I mean, Bitcoin also got a slightly higher high, but you know, total two is what really happened. So if the pattern is going to play out here, if they announce the approval of this ETF, expect Bitcoin to pump maybe 15%. Um, and again, you can't just like take the fractal, quote unquote, and then overlay it on the current action and say, well, it's going to pump exactly 15% and the timeline's going to be exactly this. You can't say that, but 15% would put us right about 50,000, right? So expect Bitcoin to probably make that 50,000 area. Um, meanwhile, after that pump, expect Bitcoin dominance. Um, I expect Bitcoin dominance is probably going to take a big hit to the downside. Um, and we can go backwards and look here on what happened. Um, this right here was the Bitcoin dominance pump, which happened just a few days, like the peak there happened just a few days after the ETF announcement, and then it dropped, dropped down. So um, the point is that after Bitcoin ETF is approved, everyone's going to say, oh, well now, you know, which new ETFs is going to be approved? It's, I mean, obviously it's, they're going to be talking about Ethereum, right? They're going to shift that all into the Ethereum hype. Probably Ethereum will get a big boost, but shitcoins in general will get a big boost, right? Like that's likely what will happen. And then if history is any lesson, a major inclusion in the financial system will be a local top, um, at least for a few months, if not longer. So um, I just don't, I have to think that's probably how this is going to play out. I don't see hardly anyone on Twitter or anyone out there like in the social realms speaking about how, hey, guys, remember three times now in the past they played us and we all got rugged. No one's talking about that. So Seems to me that probably the plebs, there's going to be juice to squeeze there. Um, maybe some big pullback happens this next year. I personally think that would be a very good thing, a very healthy thing. If the NASDAQ and all these financial markets and everything just cooled, like chilled the fuck out for, let's just call it five months. Uh, I would like to see things just like roll over, pull back, take their time. Uh, I don't want to see like massive market moves here. Um, and that would also make sense. Like if they're going to try and save some liquidity for the election, right? Maybe they want to. Maybe the Biden people and the Democrats that are controlling him um, and giving him his medications, maybe they want uh, to cause some kind of particular outcome. Uh, maybe they need to save the pump until the election cycle gets closer. I, I don't know. I mean, those things aren't really always correlated. Like it's 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 cheeky to say that, but those things aren't really always correlated necessarily. Um, but this administration has been more commie controlling of everything um, than really almost anything we've sen seen since like Roosevelt. But uh um, let's see, Ethereum, oh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, should probably take a look at that because again, th there will probably be some kind of shift. If the Bitcoin ETF gets approved, there will be a shift into the Ethereum, um, ETF. So right now, like, I mean, it is really like, this is not the kind of price action that you want to see. So this is Ethereum versus Bitcoin. This is not the kind of price action you want to see. It's like bounce, bounce, bounce. Like, oh, okay. We drop a low. Like this looks like a chart that might want to break down, but at the same time, the fundamentals are going to probably matter more here. Than, um, than whatever the technical analysis says on this chart. This is also like, this could also just be like scare tactics trying to wash people out of their um, out of their positions uh, and then it'll reverse to the upside. Like that ridiculously, um, that ridiculous uh, wick down there, that like uh, hammer, is it? No, it's not a hammer. Um, uh, maybe it is a hammer, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. This long wick right here, if price starts to move back up, like that long wick is kind of a, a bottoming signal to be honest. Um, a lot of washout happening there, so. Um, yeah. Anyways, that's that's what I would be thinking there about uh, Ethereum versus Bitcoin. I, I still I still am on my theory that um, you know that Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin overall in the next big cycle. Um, it's just so useful in in many different ways um, for like DeFi and leverage and all of the crazy stuff you know that we're like trying not to be in Monero. Um, let's see, man. I guess that should be about it for today. Uh, I think I've. I think I've ranted long enough on on price topics. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that was that was that was a good one. Uh, covered a lot there, man. You, you think we'll see? You think we'll see a Monero Bitcoin hammer uh, on a low? Like, uh, you think there needs to be a moment there with the the Monero to Bitcoin ratio? Um, I guess, man. I, I mean, <laughs> I I would expect very much a wick. Yeah, probably like a big wick down. That's. It's, it would hard it would be hard for me to think that a large wick to the downside is not in the cards for Monero Bitcoin, um, which is probably an opportunity to buy, especially like let's just say in the next one to four weeks, if there's a major wick down, like that's probably a huge buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily believe that these prices are real. I think there's a lot of leverage happening here. Leverage happens when plebs are buying. So if, if there's like 20% of buying happening 
there's 80% of leverage out there to try and, um, to try and capitalize, right. To try and like create the best prices for, um, you know, for dumping on plebs. Like we, we just see this in, in crypto all the time. We see this more and more in the traditional financial markets as well. Like whatever the organic action is gets multiplied by like five, 10, 20 times over. It, that's just a, this is something that happens. And Monero doesn't benefit, uh, benefit quote unquote benefit. It might actually be a bad thing in some ways, but Monero does not get that kind of like leverage to pump the price. It gets it accidentally kind of like gold as like a, like a, a side factor. It's like, Oh, well, okay. That, that happens because there's so much liquidity in the system. Some of it makes its way to a Monero eventually. Um, so yes, to answer your question, the longest way I possibly could, uh, I, I, there's, there's probably going to be some big wick down on the XMR BTC chart. All right. We shall see. Neon is saying a good place for Monero talk can be a gun store or GOA or NRA conference. Yeah. I was thinking that as you guys are having this discussion here in the chat about 2A, that would be, that'd be really cool to go to, uh, have Monero talk go represent at one of these conferences just like we do at, uh with like these libertarian conferences it would be cool to kind of edge into that community as well that would be so yeah if anybody has any ideas that's how we've ended up at some of the conferences we ended up people reach out to us tell us to to attend uh if you know any good conferences we should attend um to a related or anything that we think where there's overlap where the where there's a community that maybe is not necessarily very into crypto yet but it certainly would be one that would align with the ideals of Monero that realize the importance of preserving a cash like utility in the digital age. People where they're starting to wake up to that, let us know. You could email me at monerotopia at hit, hit me up if you guys have any ideas of places where we should go and represent. Man, that's a great idea. Going to gun yeah. shows. Like Yeah. That would be like such a natural fit. <laughs> I have so much fun at the libertarian conferences and stuff. Cause like the crypto, it's like you go to the crypto conferences, the same stuff all the time. It's nice to go just to the broader liberty movement conferences. Um, because there's a lot of different conversations happening there, just be beyond just crypto talk, you know? So it's actually yeah, quite entertaining too. Yeah, we need right, more than uh, than mad gains to make the world free. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks a lot. Stick around if you can, and uh, yeah, let's keep let's keep moving. Tony, you there? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Good to see you on the show, bro. <laughs> Good to see you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs>